you know, life is difficult. At its best, life is difficult. And life can be really hard, really hard, devastating, frankly. And really, the, the only good news about that is that it's going to come to an end and God is not the one doing the things that are bad. Boy, do we need to be thankful for that because if you're saved, you're going to live forever. <laughs> We're going to live forever. We have eternal life. And if God is the one making things difficult, if the reason the world around us is so difficult has to do with God, we are going to have a really, really hard future. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I'm thankful to be alive, but I'm really thankful to be alive because I have the hope to look forward to and the, the hope that things are going to be so much better in the future. You know, that's really what I'm looking for. Well, then, then why are things so bad now? Well, there's a couple reasons. There's a giant war going on. You know, God isn't in control of everything that happens. There's a huge war going on between God and the devil. And the devil and his demons, and frankly, the, the fallen people, all of us fallen people, make things really tough. And what I want to do in this video is I want to contrast two attitudes as to how we can deal with difficult situations where we can, we can either abandon God and we can become bitter, and, or we can be... Uh, we can understand why life is like it is and continually bless God in the midst of two circumstances. And these two things are highlighted by two people in the Bible, Job and Naomi. And as we get into the teaching, I want to go in and contrast Job and Naomi. But first, let's take a look at some of the verses as to why this world, why this life is so difficult. You know, the devil, like I say, is at war with God, and he's behind so much of the evil and the reason that life is so challenging, so difficult. In 1 John 5, 19, here's what we read. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. Why are there famines? Why are there floods? Why are there hurricanes? Why are there earthquakes? Why are there murderers running around? Why is, is there so much evil? Well, the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. The devil is behind so much of the evil, the devil and his demons. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, In whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. The devil is so powerful in the world today that the Bible calls him the God of this age. Jesus Christ, in John chapter 12, called him the ruler of the world. And as Jesus Christ was heading in those days toward his crucifixion, and he knew that if he were to die for the sins of mankind, then the devil would lose. And so he says in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's he talking about? The devil. And what's Jesus Christ say? Jesus Christ calls the devil the ruler of the world. Well, that fits with 1 John 5, 19. That fits with 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And frankly, it fits with what we see around us. There's evil everywhere. And the devil goes around oppressing people, and it was the job of Jesus Christ to set people free, absolutely. If we look at John, uh, I mean, if we look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Acts 10, chapter 10, verse 38 says, Jesus, the one from Nazareth, how God anointed him with Holy Spirit and with power, and he went around doing good and healing all those who were being oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Who was doing the oppressing? The devil was. So this is a lot of the reason for the evil behind what we see in the world. And then people, <laughs> people disobey God constantly. I mean, you know, even, even good godly people sin, but there are a, an immense number of people out there in the world who, who regularly 
just simply ignore God, disobey God. And what that does is it opens the door for the devil to work even more powerfully and oftentimes work evilly through those evil people. And if we just look, for example, just at the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Then the children of Israel did what was, what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Did God want that? No, of course not. God didn't want that. He wanted people to obey. <laughs> but the people wanted to do what was evil, and they did. The children of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. And they served the Baals, and then verse 12, and they forsook Yahweh, the God of their fathers. You know, if people forsake God, he can't do everything for them that he would want to do. He'd want to bless them. He, his hands are tied in many ways when people walk away from him and serve the devil. And that's what a lot of people do. And is, is this verse in Judges, is this so uncommon? No, my goodness. I, I, just did, <laughs> I just did a simple phrase search on did what was evil about people doing what was evil. Judges 3, 7, Judges 3, 12, Judges 4, 1, Judges 6, 1, Judges 10, 6, Judges 13, 1. I went through Samuel and 1 Kings 24 times. Just that one phrase. This isn't just about people doing, it's just one phrase that the people did that which, which was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. 24 times just in Samuel and Kings and all those times in Judges. You know, if we've got people on the earth that are forsaking God, ignoring his commandments, and doing things that encourage the devil, that follow the ways of the devil, well, yeah, that's going to be partially responsible for why the devil has much, so much authority in the world today and why life is so difficult. Absolutely. And is life going to be difficult? Yes. And did, did God tell us that life was going to be difficult? Yes, he did. Um, <laughs> realistically, I could, I could read verses for the next two hours out of the Bible that say life is going to be difficult. Let's pick a couple of them. This is the Apostle Paul. He's traveling. He's on an itinerary in Acts. It's Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when they, this is Paul and Silas, his traveling companion, when they had proclaimed the good news in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch of Pisidia, Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying that we cannot avoid going through many hardships on our way into the kingdom of God. We can't avoid going through many hardships. That's you and me. Oh, but, but I'm obeying God, so life should be wonderful, right? Right? No, the devil's the God of the world. He doesn't like the fact that you obey God. Life is going to be difficult. Life is difficult even if you don't obey God. But life, you know, the, my point is that life is difficult. It's challenging. Here's John chapter 16, verse 33. Now, this is interesting because this is Jesus at the Last Supper, John chapter 16. So Jesus is about to, to be arrested, taken away from the disciples. They will not see him again, you know, be able to commune with him again until in his resurrected body after he's raised from the dead. So this is Jesus at the Last Supper, and he says, uh, in verse 33, I have told you these things so that in union with me you have peace. And that's right. In our heart, in our head, we have, we have peace. We have union with Christ because we know what our eternal future is. And then he goes on and he says, in the world you will have hardship. Oh, okay, so I get it. Here's the dichotomy. In the world, life is going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. It can be devastating. But if I understand the spiritual battle in my heart and in my head, I can have peace. And so he says, in the world you will have hardship, but have courage. I have overcome the world. And what does that mean? That means there's coming a day when all this stuff won't be, won't be around. There won't be any more evil people. 
You know, in the next life, there won't be evil people. There won't be a devil. There won't be demons. That's why we know the next life is going to be so good. You know, and even the heroes of the faith, you know, we think about Hebrews chapter 11 and how it has the heroes of the faith. It talks about those great men and women who walked with God. Did they have life so easy? Let's read from Hebrews 11. This is Hebrews 11, verse 35. But others were tortured, not accepting their release in order to obtain a better resurrection. They wanted to serve God. Verse 36, and others experienced mockings and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. Verse 37, they were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were murdered with a sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, meaning they didn't have any proper clothing. They wore what they could find. Being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. That's exactly right. <laughs> That is exactly right. When we love God, when we serve God, and we get treated like that, the world isn't worthy. And, you know, here in the United States, my life, I've been, I've been fairly safe. Sure, I've been mocked and laughed at and jeered and that kind of thing, but that, that's small potatoes. We got brother and sister Christians around the world that are dying every day, you know, and... and it says the world was not worthy, and it's not worthy of those kind of people. But, you know, that's the way it is right now because the devil's the god of the world. He's the prince of the world. He's the ruler of the world. It says, in whom the world was not worthy, they went, it goes on wandering in deserts and mountains and hiding in caves and holes in the ground. These are great heroes of the faith, and yet look how they're treated. So, you know, are we going to be treated much differently? God doesn't promise us that we will be. So now we go to what, what happens when you are mistreated like that? What happens when your life falls apart? See, what's your attitude? If you understand that God is doing the best he can for you and that you're a victim of the devil, you, then you don't blame God. And in the Old Testament, even though they didn't know about God what you and I know today. They didn't know about the spiritual war that you and I know about today. But look at these two people, Job and Naomi, and the different way, ways they handled a disaster in their life. Here's Job and Job 20 and 21. So in, in this, what's happened is Job just lost his, his possessions and his children are dead. Excuse me, verse 20. And Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and worshiped. He said, naked, I came out of my mother's womb and naked, I will return there. Yahweh gave and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrongdoing. I'll talk about that in a second. And then Job 2, 7 to 10, and it says, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh and struck Job with painful sores. And who made, the, who made Job sick? Satan did, absolutely. And so he's, he's scraping himself, and he sat among ashes, verse 9. His wife said to him, do you still maintain your integrity? Renounce God and die. And here's what Job said. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. What, should we receive good at the hand of God, and should we not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Now, Job said that he was getting afflicted like that from Yahweh. And it says he didn't sin. And the reason for that was at the time of Job, which was long before the New Testament time, Job lived about the time of Abraham, about 2000 BC, about 4000 years ago. And the revelation of who the devil was and what the devil was doing and the great war between God and the devil had not been given. So Job did think God, God was behind his problems. But even so, he, he, he still blessed God. He still had an understanding that what God's doing must be good. And it says he, he blessed God and he didn't sin with his lips. Now, that's an important phrase because knowing what the New Testament reveals, if I say that God does all those horrible things, I believe it's sin because of the new, what the New Testament re, uh, reveals. Here's uh, Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10 teaching his apostles and, he, and, 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 the, and the 72. Luke 10 is about the 72. And he had empowered them 
with spirit power, with the gift of Holy Spirit. And he sent them out and they healed the sick and they cast out devils. In verse 17, and the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. In verse 18, he said to them, I saw the adversary, that's Satan. I saw the adversary falling like lightning from heaven. Sure, because the devil's up and he's accusing the brothers before God. And he's like, wow, we got real trouble on earth. And he comes down to, to straighten things out and see if he can help out. Because <laughs> down on earth, the, the 72 and the 12 were, were really ripping into his kingdom. In verse 23, move forward a few verses. And turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, blessed are the eyes that see the things that you see. Verse 24, very, very important. Verse 24, for I say to you that many prophets and kings, when did they live? They lived in the Old Testament. They lived before the time of Christ. Then they had questions. God, why would you do this? Job had questions. Read the book of Job. God, why are you doing this? You know, no wonder they would have questions. What was happening on earth, all the evil on earth, seemed to be against the good character of God. So they had questions, and you know what kind of answers they got? None. Until Jesus Christ came along, and that's why John chapter 1 says that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ revealed the truth about the war between God and the devil. And then he empowered his people to go out and deliver people from demons. And so in verse 24, Luke 10, 24, Jesus says, For I say to you that many prophets and kings desired to see the things that you see and didn't see them. And to hear the things that you hear from my teaching and did not hear them. See, you and I ought to pay attention to the to teaching of Jesus Christ so many times. I talk to people and they say, yes, well, in, in Job, or yes, well, in Exodus, or yes, well, in the book of Jeremiah. All of that has to be filtered through the teaching of Jesus Christ. They didn't know about the devil in the Old Testament like we know about him today. They didn't know about the war between good and evil. Jesus, God, the devil is never called the God of the world or the ruler of the world or the prince of the power of the air or the God of this age. None of those titles in the Old Testament those are all revealed by Jesus Christ and in the, in the epistles of the New Testament. Absolutely. And so um, to hear and did not hear them when we've got to see the war. But let's take a look at another character in the Old Testament. And this is Naomi. And again, on Naomi's behalf, she did not know that God wasn't behind her problems. And so what do we find? Well, in Ruth 1.1, We've, there's a famine in the land, and she and her family leave Israel and go to Moab. In Ruth 1.3, Naomi's husband dies. In Ruth 1.5, Naomi's two sons die. And so she, Naomi becomes bitter against Yahweh. See, Naomi's life and Job's life are sort of parallel, except Job got sick and Naomi didn't. And Job blessed God and said, should we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? And he blessed God, and the Bible says he didn't sin. Naomi, there's a famine, so she has to move her family. Well, he, he, her husband, moves his family, and then her husband dies, and her son dies. And what happens? She becomes really bitter and really angry. And in Ruth 1.13, she says, the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. And in Ruth 1.20, she changes her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to Mara, which means bitter, because she became bitter in life about what happened. And in one sense, you can say, well, I don't blame her. But in another sense, see, she's putting, she's, she's bitter because of what she thinks God did to her. You know, there's so many people that I've run into in life that are like this today. Their life is going great, so it's like rah, rah, God. And then something goes wrong in their life, and all of a sudden they're angry with God. They don't understand the revelation of the New Testament. And so they become like, like Naomi. They become bitter. They become angry. They begin to reject God. But God isn't the problem. The devil's the problem. And along with the devil being the problem, a lot of the problem is all the people on earth that ignore God's commands, of which there are literally hundreds of millions, I'd be willing to say billions of people on the planet ignore God's commands. 
And so verse 20 of Ruth chapter 1, Ruth, Ruth says to the people of her hometown, Bethlehem, I mean, Naomi says to the people of her hometown, she says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, meaning bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And whether you, <laughs> the Bible promises, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. The Bible promises that you're going to go through hardships. Now those hardships, like in my life, have I had hardships? Yes. Are they devastating hardships? No, they aren't. But they're hardships. They've been challenges. Absolutely. And, you know, the, and the point is that the, the Bible promises that you're going to go through some kind of hardship in life. The degree of that hardship isn't known but you're gonna go through hardship. And so then you've got a choice. You got, you got the example of Job and you got the example of Naomi. And they didn't even know what we know from the New Testament. But you have these two examples and, and Job continued to bless God in spite of his problems and Naomi became very bitter against God. And those are really the two choices. But I think I wanna close with Romans 8.28 because Romans 8.28 is really the truth of Scripture. And I'm reading from the REB, but you can also find the same basic translation in the NIV. And it's a very important translation because it says, verse Romans 8, 28, Now we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, even to those who are the called ones, in accordance with His purpose. You know, in all things, God works for the good. Now, you might be reading an English version that translates this verse differently, and it says, everything works for good if you love God. That's just simply not the testimony of Scripture. It's not even what God says. I mean, how can, if, if people are disobeying God and doing evil in the eyes of God, how can that be working for good? Or when God says he wants everybody to be saved in 1 Timothy, he wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth and all people aren't saved. How can that be working for good? You see, whenever you're dealing with a text like the Greek text and you can translate it, there's different ways to bring it into English. Can you make the verse say that everything works together for good to those who love God? Yeah, you can, but what do you end up with? You end up with a lot of problems trying to figure out how the evil in the world somehow or other is working out for good. Or you can believe what the translators of, say, the NIV have done, you know, or the REV. Now we know that in all things God works for the good. You know why we should bless God in difficult circumstances? Because in every situation... God is working for the good of those who love him. Absolutely, that is what God is doing. We can believe it. Things are going to go wrong in your life. Don't be like Naomi. Don't become bitter against God. Don't blame God. He didn't do it. Love God. He loves you. And in every situation, it's just like Romans 8.28 says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love you. Even in your difficult love him, even in your difficult situation, God is working for your good. We need to believe that. Thank you so much for watching, liking, and commenting on this video. And please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our future content. And if you'd like to consider donating to help with making videos like this, please go to truthortradition.com front slash donate. God bless you.